uh, as you said a moment ago, so we will have the result uh, in uh, on April on April seventh. Right now, this is the Brookhaven number that we have here. You see it down here. So I will always use these uh, units of ten to the minus eleven. So this is the uncertainty, fifty four statistical, thirty three systematic. The, the, the Fermi lab result is expected to come up with a result which and which should have an uncertainty similar to this one of Brookhaven, perhaps a little better. But this is only the beginning, it will only be the beginning. I, we should always keep this in mind. In the end, there will be several releases and results. And finally, we should have a, a finally expected result with an uncertainty of uh, one fourth of the present one, around 15 or 20, 10 to the minus 11. So much better than now. And this is very challenging for, for the standard model, of course, prediction. There is another proposal, which is uh, it's the J Park one in Japan. And this one uh, should have at the beginning a precision comparable to the Brookhaven one. So this is the summary that I prepared for the, 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 the review of the progress of the recent progress of the mu and g minus two. It's based on the white paper of the mu and g minus two theory initiative. This is an initiative that started a few years ago to try to collect and put together people working on uh, the theory of the mu and g minus two and trying in fact to come up with one uh, single number so that the experimentalist and well everyone could compare the final uh, experimental result with the theoretical prediction. Of course, there are many theoretical predictions, especially for the theoretical part, for the hadronic part, there are different ways of computing it and uh, there are differences. So it was really a large effort to try to put together all these people to come up with a single number. It worked, and uh, it, this uh, paper came out last year. It's a, actually it's a paper is really it's a it's a thick book actually. So let me let me start from the classic page of the QED contribution. I mean, I will just flash this slide because this slide is uh, seventy years of work, and I always think it's good to to show it. It's uh, always impressive, I think, to see this. Uh, it started with the calculation that uh, Schringer did in nineteen forty seven, published in forty eight, and uh, chiseled on his tombstone in, uh, in Cambridge. And uh, well, it's uh, the famous alpha over two pi, and uh, that is a simple calculation. We we teach it in the quantum field theory course. But already the two loop takes quite some more time, a bit more time, and then the three loop becomes uh, very, very difficult. It was computed by very many people. The hero of this calculation is really Remidi and Laporta, Barbier. Many people worked on this for many years. We have a perfect result, analytic. The uncertainties that you see here are totally relevant. These are just due to the fact that you have to input the mass ratios of the electron muon and tau, but these are completely negligible uncertainties. Here is the uh, one, two, three, four, and five loop contribution. Okay, this is what we have today, and they are all complete. These are full calculations, and uh, in fact, the the, the four loop the, uh, from one to four, these are complete uh, complete calculations. And uh, well, also the fifth loop is complete calculation. But the important thing is here is that Laporta managed to do the uh, semi-analytical, I would say, but analytically, let's say the the four loop calculation. This is was done in two thousand seventeen. This was for the mass independent term. And, uh, and uh, well, you may wonder if it's how important, of course, are these contributions. So let me just tell you the smallest one. The smallest one is the five loop, and this is five in 10 to the minus 11. So it's small. Indeed, it's small, and it will not be crucial for the comparison with the, or it will be marginally important with the comparison to, to in, on April 7. But um, uh, but the for loop one on the contour is, is a few hundred. I mean, this is three, three, four hundred in 10 to the minus 11. So this is really very, very important. And the fact that this has been double checked by many groups and computed by many people make us uh, feel uh, very comfortable. There are no controversies here. I mean, this result is really solid, stable. Uh, well, there is one small detail here in the, well, it's not a small detail, it's a very difficult uh, calculation, but it's not so relevant for the mu and g minus two. There is this very recent result by Volkov, computed all the 
five loop diagrams that do not contain leptonic loops. So they just give a contribution, which is normally in the literature is called A1, that is the mass independent one. But as, as it is the mass independent one, this is small. And it, this number is at variance with the result of Kinoshita. And, uh, but the difference is negligible. You see it here, it's less than 10 to the minus 13. So it's totally negligible. Um, then of course you need alpha. Once you have all these coefficients, you need alpha, you take alpha. Now uh, also alpha has uh, changed. Uh, in fact, uh, thanks to the result of uh, LKB lab in Paris in December. And uh, so this is the value that was provided by the mu and g minus two theory initiative last year. You see it here, these are the uncertainties. So the first uncertainty that you see here is very small, right? You see it here, this is 10 to the minus uh, uh, 11, 12, 10 to the minus 13, okay? You see very, very small, 10 to the minus 13 uncertainty. Another 10 to the minus 13 uncertainty due to the value of alpha. And this is an estimate of the fact that we do not know the, the six loop coefficient, but we can guess the terms which are large, they come from light by light contributions with additional vacuum polarization bubbles. So we, we have an idea of how to put, estimate the error of this missing contribution. So 10 to the minus 12 has been established. Now, as I was saying, the result uh, that came out in Paris last uh, December, the new value of alpha that came out in Paris uh, is very different from the previous one. In fact, the two values differ by more than five sigma, 5.4 sigma actually. But uh, this has an impact, an important impact on the electron G minus two, but not on the mu and G minus two. I will come back to this later on because I will mention the, the electron G minus two towards the end of, of my talk. Okay, uh, so as you can see here, really, uh, we are in, in a very safe situation. This number is perfectly well known. The uncertainty is order 10 to the minus 12. And uh, as I said, the expected uncertainty that we will have soon will be similar to the Brookhaven one, which is 16, 10 to the minus 11. So this number is perfectly safe. We should not worry about this number. Let's, uh, let's go to the electric term. This is also a very, very safe number. I mean, uh, it has been computed by many groups. Well, this is the one loop contribution. It's uh, large by today's standards. <laughs> The point is that the two loop contribution, uh, people realized in the 90s that it could be important because you just maybe expect that this is, you know, alpha over pi times this one loop. Well, no, it's not. There are large logs, the electric scale, log of mu over the weak scale, and large coefficients, incidentally. So going from one loop to two loop, there was a big uh, reduction, as you see here, from 195 to 154. But now that we know the two loop, we are really in good hands. There have been actually some even further calculation of the leading logs contribution at high order. So the uncertainty is really very small. It's really one in 10 to the minus 11, dominated by the uh, adronic uncertainties. Uh, watch out, these are adronic uncertainties, as you see here in weak diagrams. See, there is a Z here. Well, if there was no Z, this would be zero. But also here you see there is a Z. So these are adronic contribution in the weak diagrams. Very, very tiny effects. We should not worry about this at all. Now we, we come to what we on the contrary worry about, which is the adronic contribution. Now the adronic contribution is, is very large. Is you see it here in this unit is 7,000 in 10 to the minus 11. So it's big, very big. And uh, well, how is it done? Well, this is a, this blob that you see here is the adronic uh, bubble, the contribution to the vacuum polarization. Uh, of course, you cannot just compute it perturbatively. Here you run into any, low, any, any, any loop momentum. And of course you cannot go at low and low momenta in QCD. But the idea to solve this was uh, invented many, many years ago in the sixties when people, this, this function is analytic. So as it is analytic, you only need to know the imaginary part, thanks to a dispersion relation. And instead of the imaginary part, you can use the optical theorem and just have the cross section of what? Well, of E plus E minus, for example, into, well, into anything you can have in this bubble, anything you can cut this bubble into. So if these are hadrons, well, you need E plus E minus into hadrons. So you do the calculation like you do the Schwinger calculation, half over two pi, but now you have a dispersion integral to do and you can write it like you see here. This is the cross section 
E plus E minus into, well, hadrons, all possible hadrons. Now, what counts here is the fact that you have this function K in front, you see here K, this weight function. And this weight function is very much, uh, gives a lot of weight to the low energy part. So here you see the contribution from zero, well, the threshold and, and pi to infinity. And as you see, it's very much dominated by low energy. So below one GV, you have all this large contribution already. So you really need to measure E plus E minus into hadrons, all possible hadrons at low energy, say below, below one GV. Now, uh, this of course uh, is simple to explain, but it's actually very difficult to do at the level of precision that you want to obtain because you want to get, uh, if you want to take advantage of the precision of the experiment, which is 16, 10 to the minus 11, and this is six, 7,000 in 10 to the minus 11, you want this number at better than 1%. That means that you want to have this cross section at better than 1% and all its relative corrections at that level of precision. And this is difficult, of course. This is notoriously difficult. This is low energy hadronic cross section. The dominating channel, of course, is pi pi. So e plus e minus e pi pi dominates this result. And uh, this is what has been measured for many, many years. And you see the results of different collaborations here, different groups, uh, Frederick Elena, the group of Michel Davier, Herker, Bogdan Malescu, and Chang, and the group of Keshavaz, Nomu, and Teubner here. These are three results, and in fact, they are in very good agreement, as you can see. This is the value that was obtained merging these previous results by the theory initiative last, last year. As you can see, the central value essentially very close to these two, and the error is has been prepared in order to be conservative. So this number is supposed to be a conservative determination of this hadronic contribution. Now, uh, there are of course uh, problems here because this number is first of all 40 in 10 to the minus 11. It's spectacularly precise, 0.6%. But remember, uh, keep in mind that we will see on April 7 an, an experimental uncertainty, which will be perhaps a bit larger than this. But in a few years, the, the Fermilab experiment should go down to 15 or 20. So this 40 will not be sufficient. Fortunately, we have the lattice. The lattice is doing, in fact, uh, an enormous progress. And uh, typically, the results from the lattice, from very many collaborations, have reached a precision of a few percent. So they are not yet competitive at present, except for the BMW 2020 result, which appeared more or less a year ago, yeah, practically a year ago, which for the first time went below the percent precision, in fact, 0.7%. As you see, the number is written down here, 7087. And it's not the same of this number here. There is some tension with the dispersive evaluation. I will come to this point uh, later on, and I will discuss it uh, uh, a bit more in detail. Let me mm, say that, uh, of course, there are some problems here also in the fact that uh, radiative corrections here, as I said, are crucial, and this is very difficult how to implement them. For example, final state radiation is a well-known issue. Uh, I mean, you, you study channels with pi pi, and then you have to include the radiation in them. The Monte Carlo must have it. So it's really not so simple to improve this number below, uh, beyond, let's say, this precision here. However, the value that you see here in red is a number that has been agreed upon and is a I would really say a conservative, uh, conservative number. Okay, so let's go to higher orders. I will of course come back to this later on with the connection of delta alpha, but let me come back to this later. This is a pictorial interpretation of the channels. This is from the paper of Keshavaz and Oboe and Teubner. These are many different channels. You see them listed here. As I said, the pi pi channel is the leading one, but you need to measure all these channels to get the number I showed you below, before. And here you, you see a, a, a focused on a plot focused by Davier Hoeker, Malesco and Sang, focused on the pi pi channel. Now, of course, uh, this is not enough. If you have a result which is 7,000, you need to have the following uh, order, alpha of a pi times that. And this, in fact, has been computed. You see it here. You, there is an additional photon here or an additional electron bubble here. 
the number is stable, very stable. It's, you see, about 100 with the negative sign. The uncertainty is or the one, so it's really not an issue. This is not, is not a problem. Even the following term was, has been computed and was actually surprisingly large. You see, in, instead of going down by at least two orders of magnitude, it only goes down by one order of magnitude. Anyway, it is computed. This uh, diagram here, the, uh, the starting of this topology with the light by light electron bubble here gave a very large contribution. Anyway, it is also well known and uh, computed by Starnhauser and his collaborator several years ago. We are in, uh, in good shape here. Now, now the light by light contribution. Now the light by light contribution really uh, had a difficult uh, life. <laughs> Let's put it like this. Uh, it changed sign a few, a few times in, the, in its uh, difficult life. But nowadays, these are the numbers, nowadays meaning in the last several years, these are the numbers that have been determined. And this is the final value that appeared last summer from the uh, muon gmn theory initiative. Uh, you see, this number is pretty much in agreement with the, not, not pretty much, is in agreement with the previous one, but has an error which is smaller. I would like to comment on this because, uh, especially those who have maybe not followed the, the, the G minus two in the last few years, the adrenaline light by light was always an issue. I mean, people were saying, yes, this contribution is small. However, how do you compute it? And uh, it will remain as an uncertainty. Well, this changed. This actually really changed. And it changed essentially because of the use of the data-driven approach, dispersive approach. So an approach dispersive, like cutting the diagrams, just like you do for the vacuum polarization. Here, of course, it's much, much, much more complicated. It's a four-point function. But still, uh, people were able to do this. And it's thanks to, to their work that uh, this uncertainty has gone down to essentially 20%. Moreover, also the lattice attacked uh, this, this uh, problem and uh, with great success because the RBC UK QCD result uh, that appeared uh, a year and a half ago, as you see here, here, is perfectly compatible with this value here, which is obtained with the dispersive approach. In fact, these two numbers have been averaged. Okay, of course, it's totally dominated by this one, but still uh, they can be averaged and this have been averaged in the final determination of the G minus two theory initiative. Uh, even the light by light at the next to next reading order has been computed here. We, we did this estimate with the um, friends in Bern, and the number you see it here is uh, very, very small. So, not an issue at all. Now, if you compare all this, uh, well, put together all this and you compare with the experimental value, uh, you see here the famous 3.7 sigma discrepancy that uh, we, I, I mentioned earlier. Now, what do we do now? Well, uh, ah, by the way, um, you can stop me, of course, anytime. I'm not just at the end as you, as you prefer, obviously. Sure. Okay, okay. So now the point is um, 3.7 sigma, of course, right now is not enough uh, to, to claim anything. And we hope that this will change very soon in, uh, in a few weeks, or it may just disappear. The point is that uh, if this discrepancy will remain, will stay, then uh, you can say, well, uh, you have computed the Adonic contribution, uh, which has a large uncertainty. And uh, maybe there is some mistake in the contribution of the leading, the leading Adonic contribution, the one coming from the vacuum polarization. In particular, this is a question that uh, we asked ourselves a few years ago, together with Bill Marciano and Alberto Sealing in 2008, so many years ago. And then we updated and improved uh, just a year ago together with Alex uh, Keshavadzi. The idea is very simple. Uh, the point is, uh, what we really asked ourselves is, could it be that in this determination of this adronic determination, leading adronic determination, which I remind you comes from the experimental data, E plus mainly from experimental data, E plus E minus into hadrons, could it be that some uh, 
missing contribution. There is some missing contribution. I say missing because the experimental determination of the mu and g minus two is higher than the standard model prediction. And uh, this is a positive contribution. So you would need to increase the adronic contribution to, to match the experimental value of the mu and g minus two. So the obvious question is maybe you missed some, uh, some tiny contribution in the plus and minus adronic cross section. And that missing contribution is responsible for the present discrepancy. Of course, this is a possibility. And, uh, but let's take it seriously for a moment. So yeah, the idea is that uh, if that is the case, well, that means that you have to increase the, the adonic cross-section. This is it, the sigma s is the adonic cross-section, which enters the calculation of the adonic contribution of the mu and g minus two. However, this uh, sigma, adonic sigma, also enters in the running of alpha. And here you see it very simply in these two formula down here. This is the adonic contribution to the mu and g minus two. This is the adonic cross section. And the same adonic cross section appears in this other integral. This is the adonic contribution to the running of alpha at z, right? when q square is equal to mz square. The only difference, the input, the experimental input is exactly the same, the, but the, the function, the kernel function that you have here in front is different. In one case, in the new g minus two case, the kernel is just this factor k that you see here that I discussed earlier, after it goes like one over s, for high s. On the contrary, g, the, the weight for the running of alpha is at low energy is a constant. You see here, it's uh, compared to mz squared, this is very small. So this is essentially just a constant, a number. So there, there are really two very different weights between these two determinations. So let's assume that there is some missing contribution in the mu and g minus two. So I shift, let me shift the adronic cross section sigma I, I always neglect the index uh, h, but this sigma is always the adonic cross section. Let me increase the adonic cross section by delta sigma, which is this epsilon, uh, where epsilon is a positive one, the sigma s. Okay, this is how I parameterize the increase of the of the cross section. Well, uh, I can do this, of course, in a range. So I the center of this range will be square root of s naught, and the range will have a width, which is called the delta that you see here. Now, clearly, if I now fix the mu and g minus two discrepancy, so I increase the cross section, the adonic cross section, I also shift delta alpha. Delta alpha has a very important, is a very important ingredient of the electroweak fit. It has been crucial for many years in the determination many years ago of the prediction of the Higgs mass. And so this is exactly the game we played in 2008. There was no Higgs at the time, of course, as you remember, this is 2008. So the question we, we asked ourselves back, back then was, how much does the MH upper bound, which was uh, the topic of the day at the time, how much the MH upper bound that you obtain from the electric fit changes uh, when you shift up the cross section to fix the mu and g minus two? Okay, so we increase the cardonic section to fix the mu and g minus two, but then we change the prediction of the Higgs value, in particular, the upper bound of the Higgs. Look at this picture. This is the upper bound of the Higgs mass, Higgs boson mass. And uh, the upper bound uh, at the time was about here. You see 150, 160 GV for the electric fit upper bound. Now, if you touch delta alpha, or better, if you touch the cross section, the adonic cross section, and therefore delta alpha, well, you also change this upper bound, this black line. How much? Well, it depends where you change the adonic cross section, at which energy you change the adonic cross section. So here is the energy of the adonic cross section, the square root of S. Okay, where you change the beam. Well, what happens is that the upper bound that is this black line here, if you adjust it to fix the mu and g minus two, changes into the red line that you see here. Okay, so we go from this black line without g minus two to this red line to fix the mu, mu and g minus two. So at the time there was no Higgs, but already there was a lap lower bound. And this could tell us already back then that yes, you can fix the mu and g minus two by changing the adonic section, but you shouldn't really do it at uh, too much of a high energy because if you do it say at two GV, well, the upper bound on the Higgs would drop down to 80 GV and that would be a contradiction with the lap, with the lap bound. So already back then, even if the Higgs was not uh, discovered yet, we had a lower bound from lap. And we could say that this option of having a problem in the adonic cross section 
to fix the energy minus two was only viable at very low energies, below one GV and a half, roughly. Well, many things changed since then. And so in particular, yes, please. Uh, Pietro, hi, ciao. Hi, hi, how are you doing? So when you say uh, a problem, here you are referring to a problem in the measured cross-section. Yes, exactly. Okay, so not, not uh, some theoretical contribution missing, just some- Exactly, something missing measured. In the is exactly something that went wrong in the experimental input of the Adronic G minus two contribution. Okay. And the thing that you can imagine is that you missed something, but that's necessarily mean that. It, I could use the word mistake instead of uh, uh, missing contribution. Perfectly the same. Yes. Okay. Agree. Exactly. Something that went wrong in the experimental input. Of course, this is a question that many people asked because, of, well, in the past, uh, there were so many experiments that did that and many groups analyzing these results. And uh, not all, I mean, some of these results, experimental measurements were also not in good agreement. So this was a question that many people asked themselves. Well, the answer is, well, you can do it, but you can do it only at low energy, otherwise, you screw up the electroweak fit in order to solve the mu g minus two discrepancy. As I said, many things uh, changed since then. So thanks to the push of uh, Alex uh, Kishavazzi, we updated uh, uh, this analysis and improved it significantly. First of all, because uh, the analysis that I showed you before was really driven by the theoretical prediction of the mass of the W and uh, the theoretical prediction of the sine squared theta effective, the effective um, uh, weak mixing angle. We decided to do it in a more comprehensive way now, you know, uh, using uh, the using the the full electroweak fit, and in particular we use G fit. Uh. And uh, many things, of course, changed since then because the Higgs has been discovered, which is a major thing because now we have a point instead of having this range. Many observables, electroweak observables improved, the mass of the W, sine square theta, M top. There were updates in the adonic section and many fewer improvements. So we did this global fit. Here you see all the inputs that we used for these global fits. And this is the result we obtained. So this has to be compared with this previous figure that I showed you here. Now, this is the figure we have. So once again, this is the Higgs value, no longer the upper bound, the full value, the Higgs value. This is where you touch the adonic section. This is square root of S naught, where you touch it. Now, if you do not touch it, meaning if you are down here, well, then uh, you see that this is the prediction for the uh, fit, uh, the, the G fitters prediction for the mass of the Higgs. Now, if you start changing the adonic section, the value of the Higgs goes down and down and down. Uh, this, you can see it both in a continuous line or in these dashed uh, um, steps. These are just ranges that we have chosen arbitrarily, it's just a few examples to do that. So the, the upshot of this figure is once again, but now more precisely, that uh, you cannot change the adonic cross-section um, unless uh, you run into a problem of the electroweak fit. You can change, sorry, the cross-section, but only if you are at low energy. To be more quantitative, you see here, this is the one sigma bound, this is the 95% confidence level bound, you see it here. So if you go above this, this is the Higgs line, right? This is the 125 value for the Higgs. So if you touch the cross-section be beyond, uh, say, 0 0.7, you now have a discrepancy at 95% confidence level. Of course, you can do it. This is one sigma, this is two sigma, three sigma would be here, and then it would intercept it here, roughly at 1.3, probably, something like that. So the upshot is you can change the cross-section to fix the mu g minus 2, but then you have a conflict in the electroweak fit if this shift occurs roughly above 1 GV. Um, this, uh, mm, I would like to stress that this analysis here is, is pretty, uh, the input that I use in this analysis are very strong because many things change. Uh, for example, at the time, sine square theta, many of you will remember, uh, had problem, well, still has the discrepancy between the SLD value and uh, the asymmetry parameter, parameter value and the forward back asymmetry measured at clap. 
but in the meanwhile, the, we, have the, we have the measurements from uh, Tevaton and, uh, and the LHC. And now the center value, which has not changed in all these years, it has not changed, is in better shape. Also, the mass of the W went down. And this is good, because if the mass, the mass, of, the, um, mass of the W goes down, then the Higgs prediction goes up, and it's better in better agreement with experimental value. OK. so. The main result, uh, the, the first result is this one. Yes, you can touch the cross section, but only below one GV. If you do it above, then you are simply transferring the problem of the mu G minus two to the electric field. Uh, let's take this uh, consideration seriously. Let's say that I only restrict myself indeed to less than 0 0.7 GV. I need to change the cross section. But now the question is how much? Do I have to change this cross section to fix the mu g, fix the mu g minus two? By how much? Well, this is depicted in this uh, plot here. So it's a bit complicated plot to even to explain, but let me just mention the two key features. This is the 3.7 discrepancy we have nowadays. And this is the experimental value. Now we are here right now. And this is the prediction for the mass of the Higgs down here. Now, if I want to bring this uh, green band and overlap it, move it to the right to overlap it with the experimental value, so if you want to solve the mu and g minus 2 value by a uniform shift of the cross section below 0.7 GV, well, the color here changes from orange to red. What is red? Red is here, and believe me, it is 1.09 the value. This means that I have to change the cross section by 9%. So if I want to change the cross section below 1 GV, well, below 0 0.7 to be precise, because that's the only place where I can change it without screwing up the electric fit, well, then I have to change the cross section uniformly, if I change it uniformly, by a lot, by 9%, as it's written here. This, of course, is, is way too large. And I would like to convince you that it is way too large showing you this further plot. This is answering the question, how large are the required shift of the adonic cross section to fix the mu and g minus two? Well, these are, uni these are the percentage shift, the blue line that you see here, you see here is the percentage shift of the adonic cross section. If I shift it in a uniform bin, starting from threshold up to, well, up to the value that you see here. So for example, if I uh, increase it from threshold up to one GV, I have to change it by, you see it here, roughly 5% to explain the mu and g minus two. And if I increase it only up to 0 0.8, well, I have to increase it by almost 6% and so on, if it's smaller and smaller in this regime. Of course, I can change the cross-section everywhere from zero to infinity, but that of course is not realistic. But anyway, this will be a 4%, 4.1% shift. Is this large? Yes, it is huge because the in comparison, the integrated precision is given by the bl black line that you see here. This is the black line given by the uh, integrated value of the experiments. So you see, this is the uncertainty quoted by the experiments, and this is the what you need to fix the mu and g minus two. As you can see, these two values, are these two lines, are completely different. So the upshot is that. OK, yes, you may change the cross section below 1 GV to solve the mu and g minus 2 discrepancy, but only below 1, as I said, below 1 GV, because otherwise you screw up the electric fit. On the other hand, if you do change it below 1 GV, well, then you have to change it by too much, and you're in conflict with the quoted experimental precision. The red line that you see here is the lattice, recent lattice BMW result. Uh, to say the truth, this is the value of, with the version one. Version two is uh, lower. This curve is a little bit lower. Instead of being 2.8 here, it's 2.3. So it goes down by a little bit. So this shows the tension between the data, if you want, and the, the lattice uh, and the lattice determination, if you restrict to these regions. Okay. One question that uh, one can have is uh, uh, if I touch this delicate adonic contribution, maybe something will also go wrong with the electron G minus two. 
you know, the Ericsson Jimenez 2 is extremely precise, but the, on the other hand, the adonic contribution is suppressed by the Ericsson mass over the muon mass, so squared. So let me, let me just comment on this. Let me, this is the present status. Uh, what uh, these are the determination of the Ericsson Jimenez 2, the old one, uh, sorry, the old one is here, and the one by Jerry Gabrielson and his group in Harvard in 2008. Hopefully, we'll have a new value soon. The uncertainty is this one, 2.8 in 10 to the minus 13. Now, you can compute the standard model prediction. I will not show you the, 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 the contributions, but what you do is you, solve, you, you match these two. But of course, you need alpha to do this comparison. So typically, alpha, until recently, a few years ago, alpha was obtained by solving this equation. You would just assume that there is no new physics contribution and you would just match the experimental value with the standard model prediction as a function of alpha. And then you get the G minus two determination of alpha, which is the value that you see here. But in 2018, this group here determined alpha very precisely, better in fact than here, and see 0.24 went to 0.20, so better than here. And this is now, back then in 2018, this became the best determined value of alpha. Now the best determined value of alpha actually came out in Paris uh, in December, and it is this value that you see here. Another improvement, large improvement in fact, uh, factor 2.5 improvement, but these two values are unfortunately in real disagreement, 5.4 sigmas discrepancy. So, so well, so you can take either this one or this other determination of alpha. And from that, you get this or this value for the standard model prediction. When you compare with the standard model, with the, with the, the measured value, you get either minus nine or plus five in 10 to the minus 13. So you get a discrepancy, which is either plus 2.5 or minus, it depends how you call the signs. But uh, th these two discrepancy have an opposite sign, as you can see very well here. So these things has to be, to be settled. The point is, however, that it's, uh, by the way, notice that here the five loop contribution is, uh, is important because now we are really at the level of the five loop contribution. You see this discrepancy here is, is just as large and the standard model contribution. Now, why am I insisting so much on this 10 to the minus 13? Because now really what is limiting all this is this test is really the experimental error. And as we pointed out with Paide and uh, Paradisi and, and John Judich a few years ago, um, the, it's really now we have a limitation that is really due to the experimental error in alpha and AE, but the, the prediction is ready to play an important role in testing new physics uh, uh, with this observable. In fact, uh, you see all the uncertainty. Now, let's pick the, the Paris value written here. Now, all the uncertainty is here is uh, the experimental value, it's 10 to the minus 13. The other uncertainties, the theory uncertainties are much smaller. You see a one order magnitude smaller, 10 to the minus 14. Now, why is 10 to the minus 13 interesting? Because if you do a naive scaling, by naive scaling, I mean this ratio here, and mu over me squared of the mu and discrepancy, well, you get exactly 10 to the minus 13. So it would be very interesting to test the mu and G minus two discrepancy with the electron. If you have an A scaling, well, then you expect to have a discrepancy at the level of 10 to the minus 13. That's why it's interesting to go just below 10 to the minus 13. And this may very well be reached very soon. Of course, this is in a broad class of BMS, BSM theories in which the contributions scale, as I called as naive scaling, but there are very many scenarios which are different. And there you can have larger or smaller contribution to the electron G minus two. You can have EDM effects, the electron flavor violating contribution. We discussed a lot of uh, e possibilities in this paper here. But let me come back to the contribution. What happens if I change, if I solve the mu G minus two discrepancy by shifting the adonic section? What happens to the electron? Nothing essentially nothing because what happens, this is the shift that occurs to the electron G minus two when I solve the mu and G minus two discrepancy by changing the adonic cross section. As you see, it depends where I change the square root of S as always, but wherever I change it, the shift is of order 10 to the minus 13. And the discrepancy is several 10 to the minus 13. It's uh, either minus nine or plus 4.7. So really one, 
or less than one in 10 to the minus 13 difference will not change the picture at all. So the eleton is not affected by what I told you. What might be affected is the ratio of eleton over muon, which has been computed actually on the lattice precisely recently by Justin Seymour in this uh, work here last year. And uh, this may be interesting because if this, no, it's certainly interesting, but it could become very interesting the moment in which this experimental uncertainty on the lattice becomes smaller. Because this is the prediction from data, the dispersive prediction, the, blue, the green light, uh, green line, sorry. And in blue, you see the, the lattice prediction. Of course, the lattice prediction still has this larger uncertainty, but the moment that this will decrease, it might be able to test this low energy region here and put some bounds. On the, on the possibility to change the, the adonic cross section to fix the muon G minus two. These are other papers that have been written last year on this connection between the muon G minus two and delta alpha, uh, particularly this one by Kivalino, Richter, Manzani, Motul, then Eduardo de Raphael wrote this uh, paper here and uh, Malescu and Scott also followed. And then a paper more focused on the pi pi contribution by, by uh, the uh, Colangelo, Faicht, and, and Stoffer. Okay, I went a bit uh, slow perhaps on this part, but I still have, I would say, 15 minutes, right? Sure, sure. Yeah, okay. Then I will uh, move to the muon, uh, muon, muon E project. And the muon E project uh, has this, uh, I mean, it, it, the idea of the Muni project is the following. Uh, together with Graziano Venanzoni, Carlo Carloni, and uh, Luca Trentadue, we asked ourselves for, for many years, but uh, this leading adronic contribution will be a problem forever. How, do we, how will we be able to reduce this uncertainty? Can it be determined in a different way? Because so many different measurements enter in this determination very many measurements, many, many channels. I remind you, these are the, these are the channels that uh, enter. Let me just show you once again. These are all the channels that enter in the termination for many different experiments. So clearly this is a very uh, difficult uh, work to combine them all and reduce the uncertainty. Although uh, enormous work has already been done. But the idea was, is it possible to, to determine this from one single clean inclusive experiment? And the answer is maybe, in the sense that, uh, you see, let's go back to the termination we had, the formula we, we introduced before, the dispersion relation formula for the leading, HLO stands for leading, adronic leading order contribution. You see it here, as I wrote earlier, it's the product of this K function here, which I left in integral form here, and the adronic cross section. Now, you see, there is an integral here and an integral there. If you now switch these two integrals, meaning if you do first the integral over S and then you are left with an integral over X, then you end up with this formula here, this very, very simple formula here, where you have a simple integral from zero to one of the X, one minus X of delta alpha, delta alpha, the adonic contribution to the running of alpha computed at a value of Q square, which is called here T, T of X, a value of Q square, which is negative. So there is a big difference between these two formula in the sense that here you have to include data, which are time-like data. You see, this is depends on S, S is positive Q square. Here on the contrary, you would need delta alpha determined from scattering experiment where Q square is T, the Mandelstam variable T and T is negative. So uh, we, we actually we derived this formula, which is was very well known from Lau to Peter van der Affel back in the 70s, but uh, and I in fact also used by the lattice colleagues. But the point is that we realized that this formula was exactly what we needed to answer our question: whether one can do a simple experiment, clean experiment, po possibly with leptons, electrons, we thought of course, in order to determine the full adonic contribution or most of the adonic contribution leading at only contribution to the mu g minus two? And the answer is yes, if you take a scattering experiment. So you see, if you just take a scattering of two leptons here, and then you precisely measure the adronic cross-section, the, 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 the sigma of dt, the differential cross-section of this process, well, that will determine the adonic contribution that you have in this bubble. And this adonic contribution, once you determine, determine it, you put into this formula and you get your adonic contribution to the mu g minus two. 
right away we thought about uh, Baba scattering. We were thinking colliders, colliders, but this is difficult to do at the level of precision that, uh, that is required to be competitive. So we, we thought about it and we came to a different conclusion. And the conclusion is called the muon E proposal for an experiment, which is the scattering of muons on electrons of a fixed target. So this is a proposal for a fixed target experiment at CERN, where the electron are the atomic electrons of uh, beryllium, beryllium targets, and you scatter the muons, which uh, are already there. I mean, we already have this beam. It's called the M2 beam at, in the North area at CERN, which has an energy of 150 GeV. And this is exactly what, uh, what is needed. I will show you in a moment uh, why it is exactly what is needed. But let me show you first what is the idea of the experiment. is to scatter muons. You see them arriving here from the left. They hit this target. And they do muon electron elastic scattering. Well, elastic uh, in first approximation, and there will be emission of photon and many other things. But muon electron elastic scattering, these are silicon uh, strip detectors that will measure the angles of the ele outgoing electron and muon. This is what we call a station. We have to put actually many of these stations, repeat this experiment many times, many, many, like maybe 40 times, because uh, if you do it only once, then you have to make this target very thick. And if you make it too thick, well, then you have a lot of multiple scattering and the measurement cannot be precise. On the other hand, if you just put many, many stations, this, this, uh, this layer here remains very thin and you can do the, the, the measurement, hopefully, precisely enough to determine. At the end, you also may want to put an no, may want, you have to put an electromagnetic calorimeter and a muon ID to, 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 close, to help closing the, 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 the kinematics. This is the, the proposal. This is, we have a, a logo. We don't have the experiment, but we already have uh, the, the logo of the experiment. Let me show you why it, uh, why it seems like an ideal process. Because as I said, this muon beam is at CERN, is already there. It uh, can vary the energy of the muon a bit, but let's say as a, take as a standard energy, the one that they were running at 150 or 160 GV. Then this uh, remind you that this is a muon fixed target experiment. So the square root of S is very small, right? It's just two times the mass of the electron times the energy of the muon. So it is just 400 MeV. So this is a low energy experiment. And that's exactly what you need because you want to study the G minus two of the muon. Now, so if you do consider this integrand that you have here, you see the integrand is an integral from zero to one of dx, one minus x, and then this delta alpha of t of x. What is this integrand? Let's plot it. Well, the integrand is this red curve here to be integrated from zero to one. So the area below this red curve is what we want, is the leading adonic contribution to the mu and g minus two. Now, where can the experiment collect the data? Well, x equal one means t equal minus infinity, and that's, uh, you cannot reach that, of course, with an experiment. But uh, with uh, a square root of s of 400 MeV, the experiment can go up to this blue line, blue vertical line that you see here. On the other hand, on the other extreme, and which is a lot, you only have this little narrow uh, strip here, right, that you cannot reach. On the other hand, you, can, you shouldn't go too low here because if you go too low, the events become too low energy and then you have too much multiple scattering. Now, is it a problem the fact that you do not have, you cannot measure this, you will never be able to measure part of this strip? No, because at Mioni, this has been already computed by, on the lattice by Justin Simola and Marinkovic and Cardoso with a precision which is sufficient for the final result, which I will tell you in a moment. It's only 13% of the final integral. It's really ideal because you can actually think of doing using this as a signal region here. This is where there is the adonic contribution to the G minus two. And this is a normalization region because in this region, the contribution of the G minus, of the, uh, sorry, of delta alpha adonic is too small. So it's a normalization region for our reasons. Uh, this is the statistics of the beam that is available there. With two or three years of data taking, the, this is the integrated luminosity that could be achieved. And with this luminosity, the fi final statistical sensitivity that could be reached 
on the leading adonic contribution to the mu g minus two is this one, 0.3% or 20 in 10 to the minus 11. I remind you that the uh, theory initiative determination we have today on our tables is 40, okay? 40 in 10 to the minus 11. So in principle, from a purely statistical point of view, this experiment could do better than that. In principle, because this is the systematic sensitivity and the, all the trouble of course lies in the systematic effects. And the systematic effects have to be known at better than 10 ppm, 10 to the minus five. Okay, very, very, very hard to, to achieve. Therefore, uh, we started uh, doing test beams. Saran uh, let, let us do two test beams, one in 2017 and one in 2018. And these were mainly devoted to the study of multiple scattering. And the results are actually encouraging. And then finally, in 2018, we submitted a letter of intent to the SPSC at CERN for a full test run. I mean, not just a test beam, a full test run with parts of the experiment. And this was approved and it will be October this year, three weeks in October, unless there are delays due to the COVID, but up to now it's October, 2021. The full statistics, if the test run is positive, should start already in the end of next year for in the, in the, in, in the period 2022, 2024. In the last five minutes, let me just tell you that from the theory point of view, this is extremely challenging, not just experimentally. Because if you want to extract in a scattering between muon and electrons, this red bubble that you see here, meaning delta alpha adronic of T, well, then you have to know the ratio of the standard model cross section in the signal and normalization region at 10 ppm as well, just like the systematic errors. And 10 ppm for a scattering determination is fantastic. It's a fantastic number. So of course we started with the and with the next to leading order correction. Well, 11 and next to the leading order correction, the Pavia and the PSI group developed a full Monte Carlo, a fixed order of Monte Carlo at NLO. It is ready. This is is used by our experimental colleagues to 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 test, uh, to do simulation and tests. Of course, this will not be sufficient. What we need will be at least a next to next leading order QED uh, calculation. Now, this is a difficult calculation. We started uh, years ago. And in Padova here, we computed the master integrals for the two loop box diagrams. And the full two loop amplitude now is close to, to completion. In the meanwhile, two Monte Carlo were built by the Pavia group and the PSI group, and they include partial subsets, uh, gauge invariant subsets, of the next next leading order QD corrections on the electron and on the muon line. Here in Padova and uh, in Sieg and uh, Kazue, we computed the next to next leading order adronic effects, meaning you have to consider also the adronic contributions uh, next to next leading order, which should be subtracted. Anything which is not subtracted will be part of the measurement here, of course. This is an inclusive measure. Right, so it's uh, you have to subtract everything that you know, and what is left, we will call it the adronic contribution. There are difficulties, many difficulties that we are foreseeing, and uh, the calculations that we have been doing here are all calculations where we keep uh, obviously S and T and the mass of the muon, but we set the electron mass to zero. Then there is the issue of reconstructing the electron mass effects from the massless scattering amplitudes. There is a lot of work at PSI on this. And as I said, when you measure something, uh, well, this will be called uh, the adronic contribution once you subtract everything you know. So you should also consider the possibility that there is new physics there as well, and it might uh, completely um, change your result, or simply it may, may corrupt your result. So we studied also the possibility there are new physics effects at Newton. We summarized all our uh, work in, in this uh, theory of muon genus 2 uh, theory initiative, we called it. And, uh, and there is really a lot of work uh, ahead to be done. Let me mention that we meet regularly. We did the first meeting here in Padova in 2017. And then Mainz uh, kindly, the MITP kindly invited us for one of their topical workshops in 2018. Then we did, uh, we met in Zurich in 2019. And then, well, then the, the following UNE theory workshop was supposed to be in 2020. Then it has been moved to 2021 and it has been postponed again, obviously due to the COVID situation. But we will do it again. And uh, I come to my conclusions. So, well, the conclusion is that um, 
Well, the, is that, first of all, uh, the present discrepancy, you can ask yourself, maybe it's due to some mistake, as uh, Pietro said before, I mean, as I answered Pietro before, it's mistakes or missed contribution in the Adonico section. That's a legitimate question, but the answer is this is unlikely. It's unlikely because a shift to fix this conflict, a shift to fix this discrepancy will conflict with the global ETOB fit if you do it above 1 GV. And if you do it below 1 GV, it conflicts with the ported experimental error of the cross section. So this is very unlikely. And therefore, well, now we should only wait. We should only wait for April 7, and the fate of the discrepancy should be decided uh, then, and then uh, in, in the following uh, measurement by Fermilab and Jay Park. Well, if of course, if the, the, the experimental value agrees with the standard model prediction, that's the end of, of an era. And uh, alternatively, if it confirms it, well, then, uh, then uh, the interpretation of new physics will, of course, be much, much stronger. And uh, given what I told you before, that, that it's uh, very unlikely that it is due to the uh, missed uh, con Adonic contribution, this makes it uh, even, even stronger. And uh, well, mu &E will certainly provide a new, if realized, if it works, if the test one works, and if next year we will be able to start the experiment, mu &E will provide a new independent space like determination of the leading Adonic contribution. This is needed. This is needed. I think I, I, I tried to convince you in many ways, but uh, you saw that the uncertainty, we are not there, there yet, and that there are differences between the lattice determination and the dispersive ones. So a third completely alternative determination is needed. And as I said, this one is complementary to both the dispersion relation and the, and the lattice one. Okay, I will stop here. Okay, thank you very much, Massimo, for... for... Uh, the talk and um, for talking about the many different inputs. So I clap on behalf of the audience. Thank you. And so people already wrote me in the chat for, for asking questions. So I would suggest that either you raise your hand. There is a button that uh, on reactions on the bottom of your screen that you can use for that. Or you just write in the chat, I will ask to ask a question. Or if you don't find either of the two, you just unmute yourself and ask. <laughs> so I, I covered several reserved. topics. So I... yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I tried to well, give so an many, overview probably. of many, of many. Of many so Adam things. has questions. So please, I let him start. So I have the first question I have is about this G minus two electron experiment. Do you know when there will be new results? <laughs> no, I don't know. And uh, Jerry Gabriel said already a few years ago was telling me that uh, he was making great progress. Uh, but this is already a few years ago that he was telling me this. It, it, it's really awaited this number because now his, his previous value from 2008 has this uncertainty 2.8 in 10 to the minus 13. But really, that is the limiting factor now, as you, as you see well uh, here, right? It's really, this is the two point, uh, you see, the, this one is lower than nowadays. This is from alpha and the experimental one is 2.8. Now we have a new value from Paris here, 0 0.93, but we still have the 2.8 from the electron G minus two. So no, the answer is I don't know, but I'm very eager <laughs> to, to see this new value. I'm sure it will come out uh, sooner or later, but these are extremely difficult measurements. So yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I'm also waiting for waiting for it. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. But uh, it, I mean, the electron G minus two will really. A few years ago, I remember when we by the and John we wrote the paper. People were a bit skeptical, saying, "Well, the electron G minus two. How can you imagine that there will be such an improvement?" Well, it happened. It happened. Look, look what people have done. I mean, these yeah. experiments have been marvelous. When I saw the result of the Paris result in December, I was really astonished. It's it's below ten to the minus thirteen of the value for the electron G minus two prediction. So it's really fantastic. 
And a completely different question I have is about, yeah. so you're, you're arguing that it's probably unlikely that there is a, such a large error in experimental data on mi plus e minus, yeah, that it explains uh, mu on g minus two. But can you ask, what if you ask a different question, uh, can you have, uh, can you agree with the lattice determination of, uh, of uh, this? Uh, yeah, this. Uh, what, what, how big, how big errors would you need to agree with the lattice? Yeah, uh, let me show you this plot uh, um, here this plot here, which unfortunately is not updated. Let me put it larger, here it is. So you see, this is the answer of the question is this red line here. Unfortunately, this red line here is the lattice result, the BMW result. When we say lattice, we always refer to this fantastic, very precise value of the BMW collaboration because the other values from the lattice, uh, well, they are not so precise yet. So we really cannot say from the other values, but the BMW, yes, the BMW is below 1%. So that's the only one we can compare at this level of precision. So this is what, as I said, this is how much you have to change the adonic cross section at this, uh, from threshold up to, as, let's take an example again. If I want to change it from zero to one GV, then I have to change it by 5%. Now is 5% a lot? Yes, it is a lot because uh, this is, the, the integrated precision of the data obtained from what is quoted by the experiment. So of course there might be a mistake here, but this is what uh, is, uh, is quoted. So you see these two numbers are completely different. Now to answer your question is the red line. The red line is the one of the, not to fix the whole discrepancy, but to fix the discrepancy with the lattice result. However, and I apologize for this, this uh, is the figure we have in the paper, but uh, in the meanwhile, uh, the, the, the BMW uh, result changed a bit. They put out a version two. So the red curve went down a bit. By how much? Well, a number I remember by heart is that the asymptotic value, the one that you see dotted here, instead of being 2.8 is 2.3. So it's now a line here. So this red line is now more or less here, okay? It's still different, very different from this black line here. It's still very different. Now here, of course, an important thing that I am assuming is that the whole shift only occurs at low energy. I'm already using the result of my analysis before where I told you that I cannot let the overall discrepancy occur at higher energy because otherwise I would screw up the electroweak fit. So if you, if you take that, then it's hard to come, it's, it's really hard to, to, to make these two numbers agree. Thanks. Okay, so there is a question by Michele, please. Okay. Hi, Massimo. Hey, ciao, ciao, Michele. Very nice talk. So Hi. I was just curious, uh, uh, for the experiment, why you need to use muons rather than electrons? Ah, no, no. Uh, so, I mean, uh, that's what is available. Uh, I mean, in principle, you can do the with whatever you, you prefer. There are practical advantages, for example, in having the muon. The muon doesn't radiate uh, so much, right? So it's, uh, it's easier when uh, it's easier to use. It will, uh... but in fact, at the beginning, we didn't think about muons and electrons. We thought about E plus E minus. Sure. And E plus E minus would perfectly work in theoretically. Uh, it was Graziano Melanzoni who immediately told us, look, are you crazy? I mean, 10 to the minus five in any plus e minus collider is unthinkable. Uh, we thought, of course, of Chloe. That was the first thing we thought, right? Uh, the energy was, was fine. But the point is that you have to do 10 to the minus five there. And also the angles involved were not working. All this is forward scattering. So you would need, need to measure it in the beam pipe. It was not possible. So that's why we thought about uh, fixed target. I mean, you just look behind the target, right? You don't care any longer if it is uh, in the beam pipe or not. It's fixed target, so you just look yeah. behind. The muon is, uh, mm, the fact of having a muon also has another advantage. It's the advantage that you really, in first approximation, you only have the T channel. So if you only have the T channel, you exchange a photon, and the in the first approximation, you have one over Q squared. And the next is one over Q squared multiplied by pi of Q squared, the vacuum polarization in E channel, which is exactly what you want to extract. Mm -hmm. So it's very clean theoretically because the first contribution, leading contribution is exactly what you want. Then of course, at next next regards, things mix up and you also have the rest, but at least that makes it easier. But it was not the main motivation. The main motivation was really practical. And this beam is there. 
I mean, this beam is there and is is used, is being used. Okay, I see. So, and if this experiment does not agree with the other determination, uh, so it just means <laughs> well, that uh, the other experiments are wrong, or what? Well, no, or, or that experiment is wrong. I mean, there are essentially various possibilities, right? Because now, first of all, one should see what the lattice uh, comes up to, because. The, the BMW result, it's, as I said, is a fantastic result because it's, uh, for me, who I'm, I'm not a lattice person. I was really impressed when I saw that the lattice could achieve such a precision over, I don't know how many hours of CPU. I mean, this is amazing, this result. So first thing is, do let's see what the other lattice collaboration do uh, and uh, what they, if they confirm or not that value. Because if they do confirm that value, then we really have a problem, which is in a sense independent of the new G minus two. We would have two values of delta alpha, which are different from lattice and from dispersion relations. And that would be independent of how you apply it or you use it afterwards for the G minus two. Mu on E can measure exactly that, can determine exactly that. Mu on E in a sense is very close to the lattice approach because Mu on E can measure point by point, the curve that I told you before, according to the opening angle, you measure value the sigma over dt. And that's exactly what the lattice do. The lattice measure point by point, determine point by point of the curve, and then they do the integral. So once it is integrated, you can compare with the dispersive approach, but only once you can integrate, you can compare. On the contrary, mu on e and lattice can really compare point by point. So it will be very important, this interplay, I think, between lattice and mu on e in the future. Okay. But of course, it depends, first of all, if the discrepancy is, con is confirmed, if it's uh, not, then if the lattice keeps uh, having a larger number than the dispersive one, there are many ifs and uh, <laughs> we have to see. Yeah. Thank you. But clearly the motivation from you on, and I'm not uh, hiding under anything, the motivation from you on E is clearly the discrepancy. The minus two, that's clear. Yeah. 